All right, here we go. Let's put the light up a little bit here. I'm gonna take my violin out because I'm sure a lot of people will have some questions or just a few. Got my handy dandy bow here and I got my violin here which is uh, one of my wonderful favorite uh, violins. It's a Polish violin. It's uh, Jan Pawlikowski made in Krakow. Uh, 2015, was it? Yeah, it's a 2015 violin. So, so far, no, no people watching the stream. Totally fine. And uh, let's see how we do. So welcome everyone to this live stream Q&A and my goal is just to hang out with you guys for 10-15 minutes, answer your questions on anything violin playing related and I have my violin here. Make sure you go into the chat to answer any questions that you may have with your violin playing or anything about me as a violinist. I would love to share my experience with you all. And yeah, that's going to be one of the one of the topics for this morning. I know that there are maybe like 12 people who voted in the poll in the community, but figured that those 12 people are important. I wanted to make sure I provide them with this value. So yeah, ask any and ask any questions away. And maybe I might share a topic or two that have been um, that have been kind of rolling around in my head. But most importantly, I want to talk to you about tomorrow's uh, video, which is going to be about sautier. And sautier is one of those bow strokes that is from the family of spiccato, but it's not quite spiccato because it's more of like an on the string bow stroke. And spiccato is uh, controlled and off the string, which sounds different and has a different approach, has a different technique to it. So that's going to be um, that's going to be in tomorrow's video. So you want to make sure that you get to that. Um, that's going to be released probably 8 a.m. Eastern time in the U.S., so yeah, stick around for that. Uh, so as of right now, it's August, and you know, not not a lot of teaching has been going on in my uh, in my world right now. But what comes September, we're going to talk about a lot more teaching, more violent tutorial stuff. I have some creative ideas uh, that is for the channel, but you know, if that's only if the audience wants it, and. Um, yeah, so yeah, let's hang out. Let's talk uh, a bit about the violin, answer any questions that you may have. So there you go. So let's hang out. Whoever's here, I see maybe that there's one person. So if you have, so this one person, uh, sorry, I have to turn that off. Um, so yeah, ask away. So if you're interested in where I'm located right now, I mean, this is my studio. This is where I make my YouTube videos. And this, um, I, my, my printer right over here with all my other uh, gear and gadgets. But this is the room where I make all my videos. Um, I have all sorts of fancy equipment. I have the lighting. I got my um, external camera to help me provide really good, solid video for you guys. And yeah, that's how I usually make my my youtube videos for the last few years and we're kind of closing in on 5000 subscribers so i might what i might do is actually i'm thinking about doing a like a 5000 subscriber giveaway which would be really neat i'm interested in your thoughts about that if you guys are interested in maybe getting like like a small little bundle for a giveaway that'll be really cool but okay hello everyone who has welcomed the live stream i see four people here um, if you are just joining us, I just want to say thank you for joining. And I'm here to answer any kind of violin questions that you may have. You know, this time it may be a very short live stream, maybe like 10 to 15 minutes, but I just want to provide a lot of value for anyone who was interested in the beginning to um, uh, who like answered the poll. I think there were like 12 people who answered the poll for a live stream today at 10 a.m. Eastern. So, yeah, answer away. And uh, I have my violin and my my bow with me. So if you have any questions, just go into the chat and I'll be happy to answer them. You know, something that I'm thinking about lately is that I need to get a desperate um, maintenance on my bow. And part of the reason is like my bow here is starting to get a little bit unraveled, this, this thumb leather. And you can start seeing a little bit of that metal, which is a good indicator for me to actually swap out the thumb leather. 
And I don't know what things, I don't know what kind of maintenance like that costs now. I think I got this done maybe two or three years ago, but I remember the, the bow, like getting a bow rehair now costs around a hundred dollars in my area. And that's quite expensive. And it's, it was before, I think like 85, I think $85 or so, but right now it's a hundred dollars. So maybe we can, uh, we can discuss that in a, in a future video. So Ao asks, why does my left arm hurt when I do vibrato? Oh, that's an excellent question. And I also have, uh, he restores, I'm curious who made your violin and bow. Love to answer those questions. Thanks guys for answering those. So let me answer Ao's uh, question first with the left arm hurting when I do vibrato. So I always talk about in my violin videos that there is, um, you have to understand that playing the violin revolves with some kind of tension. And what do I mean by this? So when you're pressing down on your violin finger and you're probably doing a vibrato, you're probably pressing or tensing or squeezing muscles in areas that you're not really used to, especially with a violin being up on your shoulder. It's not a very natural way. You know, humans were not designed to hold a wooden sound box on your shoulder, but we make do over the last 300 years. We try to make it as convenient and as comfortable as possible. So when you're doing left uh, when you're doing vibrato try instead of pressing and squeezing and i actually had this conversation with another student who's actually learned vibrato what you don't want to do is you want to press so hard that your tension actually travels up that could be the main reason why your left arm hurts is because you're just pressing too hard and playing the violin is also going to involve releasing tension so I would be naive to say that you'll have, you'll play the violin perfectly with no tension. Well, that's just simply not true. You, it's all about understanding how to release tension when it matters. So when you're doing vibrato, when you're having a beautiful vibrato, and let me know in the chat if the, if the microphone is too sensitive, but if I'm playing a first finger vibrato, for instance, you know, I want to utilize the whole finger pad here between the tip and the finger pad, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to really get this nice in, uh, first joint relax. And that's that's vibrato right there. And this goes for all fingers. If I'm doing the third finger vibrato, sorry. The, our goal is to relax our neck and our head and you utilize the natural weight of our arm to press down on the fingerboard so that we don't have to individually press the third finger. I hope that answers your question because I see a lot of students pressing into the fingerboard for due to life. And you don't want to do that because that'll actually cause a lot of pain and tension. And actually um, back in college, I had a few colleagues who struggled with uh, nerves because they just weren't taught how to hold the violin correctly when they were young. So it is very important to be able to establish good, healthy practice habits. And one, uh, one little exercise that I can re recommend for you, Ao, is just doing it slowly with a metronome. So what I'm doing is I am doing a very like siren noises. And if you have roommates, if you have family, probably go into a basement because it might annoy them. But what I would recommend you do is focus on your breathing, relaxing and releasing the tension in your body while you're doing the vibrato. And that's essentially what, what you should, uh, what you should do when relaxing the left arm. You definitely want to be careful about that. So I hope that answers your question. Let me know in the comments if that, if it did, um, I'm going to answer the next question. He restores, I'm curious who made your violin and bow. Um, so my violin, I actually mentioned um, earlier in the live stream that my violin is a Polish violin. I actually am of Polish descent. So it's really nice to have a, um, a Polish violin made in Krakow in 2015 by a man named by, by a man, Luthier named Jan Pawlikowski. He has a wonderful workshop over there. And of course, this video and live stream is not sponsored by that workshop, but I'm just happy to share my experience with it. I've had this violin for eight years now. It's been a joy to play on. And I actually had one little adjustment made on it. And it's uh, the bridge. I actually had the bridge slightly lowered because I just like having a little bit closer finger action. I find that my playing is um, 
not the same when my bridge is slightly higher. So I actually had um, a separate violin shop in Chicago, which which is where I'm from, actually shaved down a, a new bridge for me to have a lower action. So that is uh, the violin. And I have this shoulder rest, which is Jura Schmidt's um, ultralight model, which is some, which is a shoulder rest that I reviewed on the channel. And it's really light, one of the lightest shoulder rests that I've tried. Again, not sponsored by them, but that's equipment that I have um, on my violin. And the bow, the bow is not an expensive bow. It's a, a De Silveira. It's a bow, uh, Brazilian uh, Pernambuco wood bow. And actually, I mentioned earlier that I need to really desperately get a thumb leather replacement. And I might want to get some wiring done. Let me just get that zoomed in. There you go. Get that zoomed in with the wiring. It's kind of dirty. And I could probably have them clean it or I can just have um, just get them new wiring. I, I don't know how much that costs, but I'm going to have to find out. And this, if you're interested, this is what the tip looks like right over here. It's a pretty uh, traditional modern tip of the bow. I have to really just take a look at, again, rehairing the bow. So, yeah, and uh, the strings I'm playing on, currently I'm playing on Tomasic Dynamo strings, which is their new set of strings. I reviewed it on the channel a while ago, and they have been my strings of choice. And for the for the chin rest and for the tailpiece, what I'm using is rosewood because that happens to be really gentle on my skin. I know I had some skin problems um, with ebony. Um, or a boxwood actually is a nice softwood. So if you actually are having skin troubles, you might have like a little violin mark on your neck. You might want to consider maybe using different uh, different types of wood. I know ebony is pretty sensitive for me. So I decided to go with um, a rosewood matching chin rest and tailpiece. And in addition, I have the, the, um, the pegs that are also rosewood to kind of match the entire ensemble. And then you also ask what age and level students do you have young children adults so i have a whole variety of ages so i believe my youngest at the moment is like four and a half or five years old that's when i love teaching them because they kind of have a personality the, the, the students and they're so excited to learn a lot of the time it's their decision to choose the violin because the um the students are like probably going to like some kind of instrument petting zoo and they're touching all sorts of different instruments. And usually the story that I get oftentimes is that, Oh, my daughter or my son have gone to uh, a petting zoo and I just want to uh, have them experience music. And that's when I usually start out on the Suzuki method because Suzuki method offers a lot of talent education, uh, which is great for young students. They want a boost because the violin is so difficult already and try imagining um, a student whose motor reflexes are still not quite developed yet. So we're trying to have like little mini goals with the, with the student. But as a matter of fact, I have the same approach with one of my oldest students who happens to be 72. Can you imagine a 72 year old student? And I still teach some Suzuki actually, because even though the, the, even though the material is the same, the approach is slightly different. I find that when you're dealing with pedagogy versus andragogy, which is the study of teaching adults, andragogy students tend to like a lot of information. They like to just want a lot of information and then they utilize that information back um, in their practice room. And you have to keep in mind that andragogy students versus pedagogy students, um, they, they both learn differently. Even myself as an adult, when I'm learning new material for orchestra concerts, for orchestra cycles or quartet performances, I'm, I learn differently now. And it's, it's also a fascinating topic, but uh, just to, uh, just for the age and level, I, for the level I have, again, students ranging from Suzuki, but I also have students doing Mozart Violin Concerto. Uh, I have one student that's doing Mozart Violin Concerto number two, which is the D major one. It's uh, kind of a fun one. Um, usually for orchestra auditions, you do three, four, and five. Those are the most popular ones. But D major for a first violin concerto in Mozart is really nice. Yeah, so that's the most one of the most advanced students that I have uh, playing Mozart violin concerto, which is really nice. Um, okay, moving down the list, how to hold and Louis, uh, Louis Yovayanos. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your last name. How to hold the violin without a shoulder rest. Now that is uh, 
always an interesting topic, how to hold a violin with a shoulder rest. Um, of course, it depends on your, on your body. For me, I happen to have a long neck. So if you are interested in learning how to play the violin without a shoulder rest, of course, there are a lot of benefits to have like a very pure experience with the violin. It depends if you're going on the classical route, if you're going on to the fiddler route. But for me, what I find uh, teaching violin with no shoulder rest for students who are interested is you have to really establish how long their neck is and what the relationship between their collarbone and their neck is. So you can see by right here, my collarbone to my neck is a quite a far distance. So I need a little bit of support. And I found that for me personally, and I can't comment for other violins out there, but for me personally, I actually um, tensed up more. And even though I got a louder sound, I, I happened to go back to the shoulder rest. Um, a lot of violins, maybe Itzhak Perlman, I can think of Vadim Guzman, Vadim Repin, uh, Pinka Zuckerman, those um, maybe even Anne Sophie Mutter, she plays with no shoulder rest just to have a pure experience. Just look at their bodies. They're able to accommodate that. And their shoulder rests are all uh, shoulder, no, shoulder, sorry, not shoulder rest, but chin rest is also uniquely placed. And back in Mozart's day, Leopold Mozart actually wrote a treatise on violin talking about where the chin rest should be placed. So if you're interested in me making a video about that, I would love to talk about Leopold Mozart. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, and that, that also goes back to like the, the violin uh, left hand position. So if you're playing without a shoulder rest, you're, you're always dependent on left hand and shoulder right over here. Okay, moving on. Uh, Pedro, Peter, good to see you, man. Uh, so on the topic of bows, what are some things you look for when buying a new bow? Great question. Yes. So um, with the bow, uh, it's such a unique and interesting, like specific thing. So when you're going, of course, first of all, when you're going to buy anything, have a budget. That's number one. Make sure that, okay, if I'm going to spend $1,000 on this bow, make sure that you are asking the person who's selling you the bows for only 1,000 bows. They might upsell you just to see what you might get for maybe $1,600 or $2,000 just to kind of give you a comparison between the $1,000 range or the $2,000 range. And you're really likely to overspend because they might just offer you that. But be, just be strict with your budget. Have $1,000. Like if that's your budget, have $1,000 ready to go. And just try to go with those numbers. In terms of the bow, I try to go with sound quality. That's number one. So whenever I try a bow, I do scales. Very important that you do scales to see the natural sound of uh, the violin. Um, that's for the most organic way. Uh, try not to press or squeeze when you're doing the bow, uh, when you're trying out the bow. But also see what the bounce is like. Well, you know, I just made a video on Sotie, so that's going to be dropped tomorrow. So I recommend everybody who's watching to check out that video tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern time. It's already recorded. I'm happy to share my uh, quick uh, tip on Sotie. But the bounce for me is one of the most important things when establishing a good bow. So I also want to make sure that my bow is at the, at the balance point. The bounce is at the balance point. But in addition, I want to make sure that I'm able to use different sound colors on different parts of the contact point of the string. So if I'm going to have a bow, for instance, uh, closer to the to the bridge versus the uh, finger move, I want to make sure I have different sound colors to take advantage of. And a bow that can give you many colors is a bow that you might want to consider because uh, for the record, a loud bow doesn't necessarily mean it's a good bow. A good bow could have many colors, and you you want to try to have a bow that can kind of do a little bit of everything, and that's what I try to look for. I don't have multiple bows. I just have one bow, and I find that this is the bow that I use the most often. I, I like this bow. I don't need to change anything. So I hope that answers your question. Um, the next question down, um, and we're running out of time here, but I'm going to try to answer the best I can. Um, Hum asked, I heard a lot of people talk about relaxing while playing. I'm so confused about it because I try to relax. Playing violin is so difficult compared to get some tension support or uh, by my body. Yes. So it is confusing. It's kind of, it's kind of like um, opposite. So the, um, so you can't fully 100% relax while you play. And I mentioned this earlier in the live stream that you cannot just just relax your entire, your entire body. It just doesn't work that way. Our bodies are not designed to have a wooden uh, wooden sound box on, um, on our shoulder. So 
you try to do the best you can by relaxing, by releasing tension that could involve breath, that could involve a relaxing in the neck, that could involve the shoulders, posture. There's so many different avenues that you can go with to try to relax. It could, if you are someone who practices while standing up, try to focus on standing using the balls of your feet, making sure that your knees are nice and bouncy. That tends to be a nice great way to just relax the whole entire body. You definitely don't want to be stiff while you play. That's number one. And I get this a lot in uh, in lessons where, you know, the, a student might be moving a lot because they saw someone on YouTube move a lot. That may work for the solo violinist over, you know, on YouTube, but it may not work for you right now. So just for simplic simplicity's sake, try to just relax with just the regular posture, making sure your nose is to the scroll, having your violin posture really up here. Your bow is relaxed. So the, the violin is holding the bow, not the hand holding the bow, because if you hold the bow with your hand, you're likely to squeeze. So just relax everything. Take a deep breath, kind of let it bounce, and then pull the string, not press on the string. And then last but not least for the, for the live Q&A, uh, Jub8891 asks, I'm an adult learner and find that Suzuki tonalization book a real game changer? Well, I guess it's not so much a question, but a comment. Yes, the tonalization book by Suzuki is really awesome. So if you can try working on uh, tonal, uh, you know, tonal exercises, actually even Suzuki books have tone exercises. So if you're working on the Suzuki book one, two, three, or four, there are a lot of those. Um, you might want to consider working on tone with the arpeggios and uh and scale exercises that are in those books. So that is uh, one of the elements to look out for because Suzuki always said, you know, beautiful tone equals beautiful heart. And I think that's such a beautiful uh, phrase that I always share to my students to say like, wow, music is really a magical thing. And if you're an adult learner, if you're a, if you're a young beginner, it, it kind of goes throughout all ages. I think that if you have a good tone, if you can practice a healthy tone, back to my comment about uh, about relaxing uh, from from Hum's question, you know, the more relaxed you are, the better sound you're going to get. That's just as plain and simple as it gets. And um, Peter asked by totalization book, are those the totalization exercise in the regular books or is it a whole other thing? Um, well, there are tonalization books, I think, associated with Suzuki. I can't remember the on the top of my head, but you, uh, there are tonalization exercises in Suzuki book one and two for certain. So I always have my students practice those before they get to the next student. So, uh, or not the next student, but the next piece, because it just helps prepare them mentally on what they're going to be practicing. So, um, and if you are watching the live stream, if you're watching the replay, make sure you ask some questions in the comments section. I really uh, would appreciate your comments and your thoughts on this. Um, hum asked one last thing with violins that use left hand high thumb method to hold the violin. What is the magic behind the vibrato? Do they hold the violin with their neck while vibrato? Thank you for answering. Uh, so that is more of a different technique with the thumb going up. And for me, I don't teach this because oftentimes students have a bent wrist, which does not enable them to do a lot more things. And it is a different technique. Um, a lot of, and it also depends on the shape of their hands. So if I'm doing a thumb up here, I'm more likely to maybe use the middle part of the thumb as my cushion. So if I'm... You know, the, the, the difference in the sound of the vibrato really doesn't, it doesn't make that big of a difference. It's just the way that you hold it. And some, again, some bodies are different. Like I'm a tall person, like I have a long wingspan. So for me, I really don't need that. But for some of maybe with uh, chubbier fingers, like um, like Mr. Mr. Perlman does, um, you know, for him, it might work. And he's able to use the, the fingerboard right in this little V over here near the index finger and thumb. So a lot of violinists rest on here. But that's a whole other ball game. I really don't teach that with my violinists because it just causes more problems than not. Um, not that it's a wrong way. Um, it's just a different way.
So everyone, I want to thank you for attending this live stream Q&A. I hope I answered all your questions and thank you for sticking around for, for those of you who did stick around. If you have any other comments or questions, leave them in the comments below after the live stream. We'd we'll love to get your take on it. And we'll, if you are interested in doing some more uh, live stream uh, Q&As like this, I would love to do it. I'd love to schedule them. And uh, until next time, everybody, have a good Saturday. Make sure to watch the SOTA video that I have on uh, on on call for next for tomorrow at 8 a.m. Peace, guys. Thanks.